Flippin' Physics. Good morning. My name is Jonathan Thomas Palmer, and I'm here to talk to you about the flipping physics journey into asynchronous flipped gameful mastery learning. And I just want to say thank you to Dr. Mazur, Harvard, and the Physics of Living Systems Teacher Network for inviting me to give this talk. I'm, I'm so excited to be able to talk about what it is that I do in my classroom. I don't get many opportunities to do that, and I'm just excited to share with you about it and then to get questions from you and have a dialogue about this. I'm just, I'm just really excited. So let's get going. All right, before we get any farther into this, I just want to make sure you realize that you should have watched my Asynchronous Flipped Gameful Mastery Learning video. It's 10 minutes long, goes through and describes all of this stuff, and I'm not going to do that again right here. So please, if you have not watched this video, please make sure to follow the link and go, link, link, and go and make sure you watch it now. All right, let's just do a little background on me. Again, my name is Jonathan Thomas Palmer. This is my 21st year of being a high school physics teacher. In my 20 years, I have taught general physics, college prep physics, AP physics B, AP physics C mechanics, and AP physics C electricity and magnetism. I've taught a lot of different versions of physics. For my first 10 years as a high school physics teacher, I taught just like I was taught when I was a student. I gave lectures, and I gave more lectures. I did a lot of lectures, and honestly, I was really good at it. I really enjoyed giving lectures. I liked figuring out which students I could call on to get the correct answer. I liked following the incorrect answer to see where that would take us. I loved, I loved that whole thing. I loved trying to time it so the class would end right at the bell. I was really good at lecturing. But I, I realized that there had to be a better way to do it. So I started searching for something different, just a different way of teaching. And I found the concept of flipped learning. And because of that, I filmed every lecture in every one of my classes for an entire school year, the 2011-2012 school year. And this is one of those videos. And as you can tell, it's not great quality. Please don't do this. It was way too much work and it's just not a great move. And I actually, these are the videos I used when I started flipping my classes in the fall of 2012. Not great, but it's what I did. And I've learned from that experience. My videos are much, much better now. Which brings us to the summer of 2013, when I left the classroom and founded Flipping Physics. The mission statement is, make the world a better place through real, fun, and free physics education. Um, and it was great. I really enjoyed it, but honestly, I missed my students. I missed the classroom. And there just is not much money in giving away all your content for free. So in January of 2015, I went back into the classroom part-time. I started teaching at a new school and I was teaching what I'm gonna call an AP Physics One level physics course. And we teach roughly 70% of the AP Physics One curriculum, but it's not an AP Physics course. Uh, and of course, it's a flipped classroom, of, of course. So, um, but again, I, I started searching for something different because I had read so many places that flipped learning transforms the classroom experience, but I, I didn't see that happening. Like, yes, I, I changed where the lectures were done and where the homework was done, but it didn't like transform the classroom experience. And honestly, I was sick of telling my students what to do every day. I don't know what's going on in my students' lives. And every student has a different life and they're not always ready for the quiz today or able to work on the lab today. Like, I was just sick of telling my students what to do. I wanted to give them autonomy. And I found this concept of gameful learning. The original flip of your classroom is typically called flipped learning 1.0. And when the, you then figure out how that's going to transform your classroom into something different is typically called in the flipped learning community, flipped, flipped learning 2.0. So for me, that concept is gameful learning. And I learned a lot about gameful learning from this edX MOOC, this massive open online course from professors Barry Fishman and Rachel Niemer. Um, and I, I spent, I went through this entire course and I spent a full year, almost a full year, planning out and learning about gameful learning and figuring out how this was going to transform my class. And I do want to let you know that this course, unfortunately, has been archived. You can get to all the materials, but you can't actually take the course. So again, I just want to stress, I spent a full year planning about making the switch to gameful learning in my classroom. I started planning for the transition to gameful learning at the, in early 2017. 
And I will point out that I went to administration very early on in my research into gameful learning because I wanted to make sure that I had support from my administration. I wasn't going to spend all this time researching this and trying to figure out how to transform my classroom if, without support from my administration. So please make sure you get support from your administration. And I, I started asynchronous flipped gameful mastery learning in my classes in the beginning of second semester of 2018, so January of 2018. And the reason I, I, I have students for a full year, so these students I'd already had for a, one semester. And the reason I did that is because I knew, I, I know flipped learning is already a huge paradigm shift. And I knew switching to gameful learning was going to be difficult. And I knew I was going to make mistakes. And, and just, you know, I think teachers need to be willing to make mistakes. I think the students need to see teachers learning and they, they, the students need to see teachers taking risks. I mean, we just have, the students have to see that. Like, that's how they're going to be able to take risks is if they see you taking risks. And that, may, that means you're going to make mistakes sometimes. And, and I knew initially the class was not going to be as good as it was before I switched to Gameful Learning. Uh, however, I, I knew it would eventually be much better. And I got to tell you, I was right. So you have to be willing to make a big transition and admit to yourself, things are going to be, it's going to be hard. Things are not quite going to be as good as they were before, but eventually everything will be much better than it was before I made that change. Let's talk about some of those initial mistakes and corrections that I made. First off, uh, from the Gameful Learning MOOC, one of the things that they suggested was to give every level a fun name. So I named every level after a famous physicist. And it was a disaster. Students couldn't figure out what level they were, like what this level had to do with what was going on in the level. So now I just, every level is the name of the topic for the level. And it may not be as much fun, but it's a lot more user friendly. I also did not provide guideposts. <laughs> So now the online gradebook has suggested due dates for all assignments. Every assignment, if you look in the, their gradebook, they can see this assignment is due by this particular date. And those are due dates. They're not actually due dates. They're su just suggested dates. So you know, if I'm on pace, I should have this assignment done by this particular date. And every level now has a suggested completion date. Another thing I did not do is I did not check in enough with the students about their plan. And to be honest, this is still a work in progress. I've tried Google feedback forms. I've tried individual conferences. I've tried requiring students to make a plan. Uh, and I'm not, still not happy with how it works. And um, it's just still a work in progress. It's better, but I'm still working on it. And I don't know why I didn't learn the first time. Well, the first time when I flipped my classes, I did not lecture. And when I switched to Gameful Learning, I did not lecture again. And both times I got feedback from students saying, we really would like you to lecture. So now I do have some lectures which serve as guideposts for you should understand this material by this point. And another mistake I made was I did not provide current grade feedback. Honestly, the online gradebook that they have does not work well with Gameful Learning. So what I do now is I provide a current grade via weekly student gameful learning progress report, which I'm gonna talk about now. So this item right here, I create in Excel every weekend and I post online. And I just find it funny because this I just harkens back to the fall of 2000 when I started teaching and I learned that my school district didn't have any way to report to students what their grades were. So I created an entire web page, wrote it in HTML, and every weekend I would use Excel and I would post what their grades were online just like this. Uh, and the reason I have to do this is because, again, their gradebook just does not work well with Gameful Learning. So on the far right, you will see the 100% points. So you could see at the end of each week, I have identified how many points you should have in order to have 100% in the class. And you can see I've created a grading scale based on that for this particular week. And you could see the students then I've reported what their points are and what their percentage is at this point. So I like to think of this as a progress bar. On the right hand side, 100%, the points in the class progress as you go through the class. These are the number of points you should have in order to have a 100% in the class. And so as a student, if you have a percentage that's lower than 100%, you are behind where you should be in the class. And if you have more than 100%, you are ahead of where you should be in the class. So this is not like a typical grade, like in a normal class. This is just like a 
it's a progress report of where you currently are in the class. And it just gives students feedback of whether they're moving fast enough or if they're moving too slowly. People wanna know, what is this actually like? Well, honestly, it's craziness. You saw the time-lapse video. The teacher is everywhere all at once, moving around, students are moving around, and this just does not conform to normal teaching. It does not conform to normal teacher evaluations. You need to be aware of that. Like this whole idea that today we're working on X, Y, or Z, and I'm gonna stand up here and I'm gonna teach you this. It's just not, just doesn't work. So if you wanna know what's the goal for today, you need to talk to the, each student because they're all gonna have a different goal for the day. They're gonna have a different thing that they're working on. So it's just not normal. And I gotta be honest, much of the teacher work is done before the semester even begins. Before the semester begins, you have to have all the assignments laid out. You need to know exactly what's gonna happen to, during the entire semester so that everything is laid out. Now, I do make changes to the class as we go through, but really the whole skeleton is there. It's all set up already before the school year starts. Assignments are turned in when the student is ready. They don't turn in stuff if they don't understand it. So literally I have students show me their work before they turn it in and I give them feedback. And therefore they know when they turn it in that they understood the material. And because of this, grading is no longer like a breaking dam. It's not like, Look, I had a quiz in a lab due, so now I have pfft, all this stuff I need to grade. Grading is like a constant flow rate. Every time I have class, I have stuff I need to grade. And it's just a constant. And it's much easier to deal with, honestly. It's just easier. And little thing, I no longer make paper copies of anything for students. We are now a one-to-one -one school district because of the pandemic. Every student has a Chromebook. I have a printer in my room, and when a student needs something, they print it out themselves. It's actually really awesome. <laughs> so don't tell anyone, but I don't make copies anymore. <laughs> okay, so this is so much more efficient with the student's time. They, there's never a time where they don't have something they could work on. They finish a quiz, they can work on the next thing. There's all, you know, you've got 15 minutes left in class, watch a couple videos. Like really, they can always have something that they're working on. And honestly, it's just easier for students to be absent or have some, something else going on in their lives because they can work on it here or there and they can decide exactly what they're going to work on. Uh, honestly, this shakes up lab groups. Because students are absent, like I was absent in my lab group that I normally work with, so I already worked, already did this lab, so now I'm here and I gotta work with this other person. And so at the beginning of class, often I will like help students figure out who's working on what, who needs to work on which lab, and it shakes up lab groups. Something I've been wanting to do for my entire career as a teacher, and this asynchronous flip gameful mastery learning creates different lab groups. And honestly, it is so atypical, it is refreshing. I hear this from students. It's just the, the way the classes run is just so different. It's just refreshing. Uh, and some of my students actually start class early and or leave late. So I have some students who will like arrive and like 10 minutes before class, they'll just start working on stuff and they'll start asking me questions because they, they recognize that this is no longer like me deciding now we're gonna start working on stuff. They're the ones who are in charge of their own learning. And I, and I have a student who actually doesn't have a class for the class after their class. So rather than like picking up and leaving right at the end of the class, they just stay and finish what they're working on. And then 10, 15 minutes later, they end up leaving. It's just awesome. And it is so much easier to make up assignments when students are absent because of the way the class is structured. And I will tell you, beginning this year, I am now running a concurrent AP Physics C mechanics option in my class. I have some of my students, the majority of my students, who are working on the algebra-based physics class that we normally have, and I've layered on top of that the option to add calculus-based physics. So I have some students who are concurrently doing both the algebra and adding on the calculus-based AP Physics C mechanics option. And I gotta tell you, I don't know how I would be able to do it without asynchronous flip gameful mastery learning to be able to run those concurrently in the same classroom, but it is awesome. Let's get into some of the specifics. Points. Each semester has roughly six levels. Every level has optional practice problems worth one point each. Each level has between five and 30 practice problems, and you must do at least 10 practice problems to submit, the for, submit for a grade, or if there are fewer than 10, you have to do all of them. And remember, these are optional practice problems. The students do not have to do them. And I provide my solutions to all practice problems. 
Every level has one mandatory and one optional worksheet, each worth six points. And again, I provide my solutions to all worksheets. Every level has an optional practice quiz worth six points. I provide my solutions to all practice quizzes. Every level has a culminating mandatory quiz worth 25 points. And no, I do not provide my solutions to quizzes. Almost every level has at least one mandatory lab worth 15 to 55 points. Most of my labs are actually in the 45 to 55 point range and require most of a 100 minute class to collect data. And my labs require students to use either Excel or Google Sheets to analyze and interpret data. And no, I do not provide solutions for my labs. Uh, some of my levels actually also have an optional lab worth between 15 and 30 points. And each semester has a large group project worth 90 points. And yes, I wish I had my students do more labs and more projects. I think that's true of every physics teacher, uh, but there's just room for me to grow and learn. Quizzes. A quiz score of at least 80% is required to pass each level. If a student gets less, less than 80%, they must do quiz corrections. They gain a half a point back for every point they lost when they do quiz corrections. And if you have at least 80% after having done quiz corrections, then the student passes the level. So notice 60 to 80% passes with quiz corrections. If a student gets, well, gets less than 60%, they get to do a quiz retake, they also do quiz corrections, and their final quiz grade is an average of the quiz scores. So every quiz becomes a learning experience. Think about that. If you get 80% or more, you've illustrated that you understand the material, you can move on. If you get less than 80%, you have to do quiz corrections and you have to illustrate that you understand the material before you move on, which is awesome. And this makes quizzes less scary because if they do poorly on the quiz, that just means that they then have to sit down with me and work on quiz corrections and make sure they understand the material. It does not negatively impact their grade. It just means that they don't understand the material yet, but they will before they move on. And I can't stress this, stress this enough. Students take quizzes when they think they are ready to take the quiz. It's huge. Cheating. I abhor cheating, let's talk about it. Uh, most of the student work is done in the class, which mitigates cheating. Think about it, if, all, if most of the work that the students do is actually in the class with the teacher wandering around, it just mitigates cheating. I encourage working as a group on every assignment with the exception of quizzes and final exams. They know the difference between working together and copying another student's work. So, and I also, we spend time talking about it and making sure that they do understand that. And I will tell you, I train them to teach one another. When I've answered one question from one student and another student comes up and asks them the same question, I bring that student over to the other one and I say, hey, I already answered this question for you. Could you help this other student understand the answer to this question? And I stay there and I help them work their way through teaching one another. And I do this over and over again during the, during the school year. I help them teach one another. And as we get farther and farther into the school year, they start to do it on their own without my prodding. And it is awesome. And it mitigates cheating. I have at least five different versions of every quiz, not just changing the numbers, different problems, and just mitigates cheating. They cover the same topics, but it mitigates cheating. So, and, and by making quizzes more of a learning tool and less scary, students are less compelled to cheat. I mean, really, it's just the quizzes are not as stressful, so they aren't as compelled to cheat. Also, I provide solutions for everything except labs, quizzes, and final exams, which means they know that they understand the material or don't understand the material. And if they don't understand the material, they spend more time learning it before they take the quiz. And students cannot pass each level until they understand the material, until they've illustrated on a quiz that they understand the material. And they learn early on that copying the material does not actually help them learn because sometimes I do get students who copy my solutions and I can tell, and then they take the quiz and they do not do well. And we have a conversation about it and they learn that they actually need to learn the material. Thank you for watching. I, I know I shoved a lot at you. Please sign up for the live Zoom question and answer session because I know you have questions. It's on Saturday, November 20 from 11 a.m. to noon Eastern Standard Time. The links, I'm sure, are someplace obvious. Thank you very much for learning with me today. I enjoyed learning with you.